The following is a truncated version of This Week in Amateur Radio. Please visit TWIAR.net for the full version. Now in our 21st year of service to the amateur radio community worldwide, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1134 of This Week in Amateur Radio. We will be updating a story from last week as the ARRL seeks a waiver of the proposed FCC amateur radio application fees. The National Science Foundation begins plans for the decommissioning of the 305-meter Arecibo telescope. An international broadcast station interference overwhelms the hurricane watch net during Tropical Storm Iota. SpaceX Dragon Capsule Resilience ferries four amateur radio operators to the International Space Station. An Arizona Congresswoman introduces the National Amateur Radio Day Resolution. An academic paper predicts that Sunspot Cycle 25 could be among the strongest ever. And here's some good news. An academic paper predicts that Sunspot Cycle 25 could be among the strongest ever. And we will tell you about Santa on the air, getting on the air during Christmas lockdowns, and we will celebrate 20 years of amateur operation aboard the space station. All this and a lot more is straight ahead in this special expanded edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. Australia's own Anna Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will tell us about special event call signs around the world. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill looks back to 1912 and how the Titanic disaster had a major effect on the new upcoming wireless regulations. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about utilizing lockout tagout protocols when working on your repeater antenna mounted on a commercial tower. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. Reporting from our news bureau in the broadcast capital of the world, this is N2WWW in Schenectady, New York. And reporting from our sunny but frigid news bureau in Troy, New York, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2RJX. And reporting from our ham radio studios in the Catskill Mountains of New York, where the 20 degrees and snowy weather of yesterday has turned into a 60 degree summer day here. I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Northwest Arkansas, where signs of Christmas abound, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Leading off this week's news is an update to a story we have been covering for the last few weeks. The ARRL has urged the FCC to waive its proposed $50 amateur radio application fee. The commission proposal was made last month in a notice of proposed rulemaking in MD Docket 20-270. The proposal already has drawn more than 3,200 individual comments overwhelmingly opposed to the plan. The fees, directed by Congress and imposed on all FCC-regulated services, are to recover the FCC costs of handling and processing applications. Amateur radio applications were not listed when the Congress adopted its 1985 fee schedule for applications, and therefore amateur license applications were excluded from the collection of fees, ARRL said, on November 16th in its formal comments on the proposal. Similarly, a decade later when regulatory fees were authorized, the amateur service was excluded except for the costs associated with issuing vanity call signs. The new statutory provisions are similar. Amateur radio license applications are not addressed in the application fees section and explicitly excluded from the regulatory fees, ARRL said, and there is no evidence of any intent by Congress to change the exempt status of amateur applications and instead subject them to new fees. 
ARRL argued that the FCC has explicit authority to waive the fees if it would be in the public interest and should do so for the amateur radio service. Unlike other FCC services, the amateur radio service is all volunteer and largely self-governing with examination preparation, administration, and grading handling by volunteers who submit licensing paperwork to the FCC, the ARRL pointed out. Increasingly, the required information is uploaded to the Commission's database, further freeing personnel from licensing paperwork, as well as from the day-to-day -day examination process, as the ARRL said. The addition of an application fee will greatly increase the complexity and requirements for volunteer examiners. The Communications Act, ARRL noted, also permits the FCC to accept the volunteer services of individual radio amateurs and organizations in monitoring for rules violations. In 2019, ARRL and the FCC signed a Memorandum of Understanding to Renew and Enhance the ARRL's Volunteer Monitor Program, relieving the Commission of significant time-consuming aspects of enforcement. These volunteer services lessen the regulatory burden, including the application burden, on the Commission's resources and budget in ways that licensees and other services do not, the ARRL said. Amateur Radio's role in providing emergency and disaster communication, education, and other volunteer services also justifies exempting radio amateurs from FCC application fees. For example, ARRL noted last year, more than 31,000 amateurs participated as members of the ARRL Amateur Radio Emergency Service and local ARIES teams reported taking part in more than 37,000 events, donating nearly 573,000 volunteer hours, providing a total value of more than $14.5 million. Amateur Radio also has motivated many students to develop critical science, technology, engineering, and mathematical skills. ARRL noted that the amateur radio service contributes to the advancement of the radio art, advances skills in communication and technology, and expands the existing reservoir of trained operators, technicians, and electronic experts, all expressed bases and purposes of the amateur radio service. Accomplishing these purposes entails working with young people, many of whom may have difficulty paying the proposed application fees of $50, $100, or $150, ARRL said. The $150 fee would be the cost of passing the examinations for the three amateur license levels and three examination sessions, ARRL said. Such multiple application fees to upgrade would dampen the incentive to study and demonstrate the greater proficiency needed to pass the examinations for the higher amateur classes. ARRL concluded that the FCC should exercise its authority to exempt amateur radio from application fees generally. If the FCC cannot see its way clear to waive fees for all amateur radio license applications, the fees should be waived for applicants aged 26 years and younger. Such individuals, ARRL contended, have the most to contribute to the future of radio technology and other STEM-related activities and are the most likely to find the proposed application fees burdensome. The damaged 305-meter radio telescope at Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico will be decommissioned due to safety concerns, the National Science Foundation announced on Thursday, November 19th. The iconic dish has served as a backdrop for several science fiction movies. The Arecibo Observatory Amateur Radio Club, KP4AO, is headquartered at the research facility and several radio amateurs are employed there. Following a review of engineering assessments that found damage to the Arecibo Observatory cannot be stabilized without risk to construction workers and staff at the facility, the United States National Science Foundation will begin plans to decommission the 305-meter telescope, which for the past 57 years has served as a world-class resource for radio astronomy, planetary, solar system, and geospace research, the National Science Foundation said. The decision comes after the National Science Foundation evaluated multiple assessments by independent engineering companies that found the telescope structure is in danger of a catastrophic failure and its cables may no longer be capable of carrying the loads they were designed to support. 
The National Science Foundation said several assessments suggested that any attempts at repairs could put workers in potentially life-threatening danger, and even if repairs were possible, engineers found that the structure would likely present long-term stability issues, the NSF said. National Science Foundation Director Sethuraman Panchanathan expressed regret about what he called a profound change and said the observatory will explore ways to assist the scientific community and maintain its strong relationship with the people of Puerto Rico. Engineers have been examining the monster dish since August when one of its support cables experienced a catastrophic failure, damaging sections of the reflector dish. The National Science Foundation authorized the University of Central Florida, which manages Arecibo, to take what it called all reasonable steps and use available funds to address the situation while ensuring safety remained the highest priority. Engineers had designed and were ready to implement emergency structural stabilization of the auxiliary cable system, but while arranging delivery of two replacement cables and two temporary cables, a main cable broke on the same tower on November 6th. Based on the stresses borne by the second broken cable, engineers concluded that the remaining cables were likely weaker than originally projected. The cables, connected to three towers, suspend a 900-ton instrument platform that hangs 450 feet above the dish. Until these assessments came in, our question was not if the observatory should be repaired, but how, said Ralph Gaum, director of the National Science Foundation's Division of Astronomical Sciences. But in the end, a preponderance of data showed that we simply could not do this safely, and that is a line we cannot cross. The decommissioning process involves developing a technical execution plan and ensuring compliance with a series of legal, environmental, safety, and cultural requirements over the coming weeks. The NSF has authorized a high-resolution photographic survey using drones and is considering options for forensic evaluation of the broken cable, if such action could be done safely, to see if any new evidence could inform the ongoing plans. This work has already begun and will continue throughout the decommissioning planning. Equipment and other materials will be temporarily moved to buildings outside the danger zone. When all necessary preparations have been made, the telescope would be subject to a controlled disassembly. The decommissioning plan focuses only on the 305-meter telescope and is intended to safely preserve other parts of the observatory that could be damaged or destroyed in the event of an unplanned catastrophic collapse, the NSF said. The plan aims to retain as much as possible of the remaining infrastructure of Arecibo Observatory so that it remains available for future research and educational missions. Over its lifetime, Arecibo Observatory has helped transform our understanding of the ionosphere, showing us how density, composition, and other factors interact to shape this critical region where Earth's atmosphere meets space, said Michael Wiltberger, head of the National Science Foundation's geospace section. While I am disappointed by the loss of the investigative capabilities, I believe this process is a necessary step to preserve the research community's ability to use Arecibo Observatory's other assets and hopefully ensure that important work can continue at the facility. After the telescope decommissioning, the National Science Foundation would intend to restore operations at assets such as the Arecibo Observatory LIDAR facility, a valuable geospace research tool, as well as the visitor center and off-site Culebra facility, which analyzes cloud cover and precipitation data. NSF would also seek to explore possibilities for expanding the educational capacities of the Learning Center. As Category 4 Hurricane Iota neared landfall in Central America on November 16th, 
The Hurricane WatchNet was forced to suspend operations at 0300 UTC because of what Hurricane Watch Net Manager Bobby Graves, KB5HAV, described as deafening interference from a foreign AM broadcast station that came out of nowhere at 0200 UTC. At the time, the net had shifted to its 40-meter frequency of 7.268 kHz, collecting real-time weather and damage reports via amateur radio. This was heartbreaking for our team, as the eyewall of Iota was just barely offshore, Graves said. The storm had weakened slightly to a Category 4 hurricane with sustained winds of 155 miles per hour. After activating at 1300 UTC, the net was able to collect and forward reports from various parts of Nicaragua and Honduras via WX4NHC throughout the day for relay to forecasters at the National Hurricane Center in Miami. Iota was the most powerful storm on record to make landfall this late in the hurricane season. Graves said the very strong AM signal was on 7.265 MHz. For my location, it was S9, he told ARRL. You could not hear anything but the broadcast station. The source of the signal was not clear, but as he noted, other foreign broadcast stations are to be heard from 7.265 to 7.3 MHz and splattering close by. Stations handling emergency traffic during the response to Category 5 Hurricane Iota had requested clear frequencies on November 16th to avoid interfering with the Hurricane WatchNet and with WX4NHC, as well as with a Honduran emergency net operation on 7.180 MHz and a Nicaraguan emergency net operating on 7.098 MHz. It's not known if these nets were also affected by interference from the numerous broadcasters on 40 meters. Thank you to all who allowed us a clear frequency, Graves said, on behalf of the Hurricane Watch Net. Iota made landfall not far from where Hurricane Eta had come ashore in Central America just a week earlier before soaking southern Florida. Central America is still recovering from Eta. Hurricane Iota weakened significantly following landfall, but not before delivering some 30 inches of rain, catastrophic winds, and mudslides to huge swaths of Central America. Forecasters say storm swells could be felt as far north as the Yucatan Peninsula, as far east as Jamaica, and as far south as Colombia. No deaths were reported in Nicaragua. Authorities were said to be monitoring rivers and sheltering vulnerable populations. I dare say, don't let your guard down, Graves said. A new tropical wave has developed behind Iota. Should this become a storm, it will be named Kappa. SpaceX Dragon Capsule Resilience, carrying four radio amateurs, autonomously docked on the November 17th at 4.01 UTC with the International Space Station. The SpaceX Falcon 9 launcher carried the precious payload, went into space on Sunday, November 15th, from NASA's Kennedy Space Center. They comprise the International Space Station Expedition 64 and 65 crew. Well, the ISS is loaded with hams now. Amateur radio on the International Space Station, or ARISS, U.S. delegate for the ARRL, Rosalie White, K1STO, said on Tuesday. These four arrived very early in the morning Eastern Time. NASA astronauts Victor Glover, KI5BKC, Mike Hopkins, KF5LGAG, and Shannon Walker, KD5DXB as well as Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Soichi Noguchi, KD-5-TVP. This marks Glover's first time in space. All others are International Space Station veterans. Earlier this year, NASA ISS HAM Project Coordinator Kenneth Ransom, N5VHO, held amateur radio licensing study sessions for Glover, who passed the technician exam on August 20th. The form will remain on station until next spring. They joined Expedition 64 Commander Sergei Ryzhikov and Flight Engineer Sergei Zverkov of the Russian space agency Roskomos on the ISS. White said all but Noguchi will likely take part in Aris contacts with schools. White said the first school contact is tentatively scheduled for December 4th with Tecumseh High School in Oklahoma, home of the Tecumseh High School Amateur Radio Club, K5THS. She said the students have earned their ham licenses, and the club has built an antenna and is leaning, learning about satellites and circuits. The Sunday launch from the Kennedy Space Center was marked only the second crewed flight for the SpaceX Crew Dragon, which became the first commercial vehicle to put humans into orbit when astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin, KE-5 GGX, launched in May 
and NASA gave SpaceX the go for future such launches. United States Representative Debbie Lesko of Arizona has introduced a resolution to designate April 18th, 2021 as National Amateur Radio Operators Day to recognize the important contributions of amateur radio operators. Amateur radio operators are critical in times of crisis and our communities are safer thanks to their dedication to sharing important information with the public, Lesko said. She was approached to introduce the resolution by 12-year-old Raymond N7KCB from Peora, Arizona. I started long distance responders so I can help prepare the community for emergencies with amateur radio, said Raymond. There might be a price for a radio, but the ability and knowledge to help someone is truly priceless. As Lesko's resolution notes, World Amateur Radio Day is celebrated annually on April 18th to commemorate the founding of the International Amateur Radio Union in 1925, and she said her resolution recognizes the amateur radio community with a national day in the United States in 2021. The resolution cites the Amateur Radio Emergency Service for providing invaluable emergency communication services following recent natural disasters, including but not limited to helping coordinate disaster relief efforts following Hurricanes Katrina, Wilma, and Mariah, and other extreme weather disasters. A research paper called Overlapping Magnetic Activity Cycles and the Sunspot Number Forecasting Sunspot Cycle 25 Amplitude by Scott W. McIntosh, Deputy Director of the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, has concluded that Solar Cycle 25 could be among the strongest sunspot cycles ever observed and will almost certainly be stronger than the just-ended Solar Cycle 24. The scientists say it will also most likely be stronger than Solar Cycle 23. The abstract explains that the Sun exhibits a well-observed modulation in the number of spots on its disk over a period of about 11 years. From the dawn of modern observational astronomy, sunspots have presented a challenge to understanding. Their quasi-periodic variation in number, first noted 175 years ago, stimulates community-wide interest to this day. A large number of techniques are able to explain the temporal landmarks, geometric shape, and amplitude of sunspot cycles. However, forecasting these features accurately in advance remains elusive. Recent observationally motivated studies have illustrated a relationship between the sun's 22-year magnetic cycle and the production of the sunspot cycle landmarks and patterns, but not the amplitude of the sunspot cycle. Using discrete Hilbert transforms on more than 270 years of monthly sunspot numbers, we robustly identify the so-called termination events that mark the end of the previous 11-year sunspot cycle. The enhancement and acceleration of the present cycle and the end of 22-year magnetic activity cycles. Using these, we extract a relationship between the temporal spacing of terminators and the magnitude of sunspot cycles. Given this relationship and our prediction of a terminator event in 2020, we deduce that sunspot cycle 25 could have a magnitude that rivals the top few since records began. This outcome would be in stark contrast to the community consensus estimate of Sunspot Cycle 25 magnitude. The ARRL November Sweepstakes Phone Weekend is upon us, and this year participants will have to search out an additional section. The SSB event is from November 20th to the 22nd UTC, getting underway at 2100 UTC on Saturday and continuing through 259 UTC on Monday. Stations may operate 24 of the available 30 hours. The Sweepstakes Operating Guide package, available for download, includes all rules and examples of log formatting. The deadline to submit Sweepstakes phone entries is November 29th. The number of ARRL and Radio Amateurs of Canada sections rose to 84 earlier this year with the addition of Prince Edward Island as a separate entity. The objective of sweepstakes, or sweeps, is to work as many sections and as many of the 84 sections as possible within 24 hours of operating. The number of sections worked is a score multiplier, and working all of them is a clean sweep. The Sweepstakes Contest Exchange has deep roots in message handling protocol and replicates a radiogram preamble. In sweepstakes, stations exchange 
A consecutive zero number. Operators do not have to add zeros ahead of numbers less than 100. Operating category or precedence is Q for single op, QRP, A for single op, low power up to 150 watts output, B for single op, high power, greater than 150 watts output, U for single op, unlimited, regardless of power, M for multi-operator, regardless of power, and S for school club. The call sign, a check, the last two digits of the year of the first license for either operator or station, and section, ARRL or RAC section. If you have any questions, please direct them to the ARRL contest program. Since 1999, the annual Skywarn Recognition Day has celebrated the long relationship between the amateur community and the National Weather Service. Skywarn Recognition Day 2020 will take place from 0000 UTC to 2400 UTC on December 5th. Amateur radio operators comprise a large percentage of Skywarn volunteers across the country. The purpose of the event is to recognize amateurs for the vital public service they perform during times of severe weather and to strengthen the bond between radio amateurs and the local National Weather Service office. The event is co-sponsored by ARRL and the National Weather Service. Normally each year radio amateurs participate from home stations and from stations at the National Weather Service forecast office with the goal of making contact with as many offices as possible. This year, due to the pandemic, Participation from the National Weather Service Forecast Office is expected to be minimal, so the focus will shift this year to contacting as many trained Skywarn spotters as possible. During the event, operators are encouraged to exchange their name and home station, Skywarn Recognition Day number, and the current weather conditions, along with other participating stations. The event website provides complete operating guidelines. Radio amateurs may sign up for a Skywarn Recognition Day number by completing a participant sign-up form. A Skywarn Recognition Day Facebook page has been created and will host a variety of live and recorded segments throughout the day. Monday, April 15, 1912, 12.30 a.m. We are over the North Atlantic at 41 degrees 46 minutes north and 50 degrees 14 minutes west. Down below is a majestic ship, the largest and most luxurious ship in the world on its maiden voyage. In the wireless room is a 5 kilowatt Marconi station, and before it sit two tired operators who make $20 per month, not as employees of the shipping line, but rather as employees of the Marconi company. The in-basket is still full of messages, everything from personal telegrams to stock market quotations. They are so busy working Cape Race, Newfoundland, that they didn't even notice the slight grinding jar 30 minutes earlier. As the two wireless operators, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, passed the routine traffic, the captain came in, said the ship had struck an iceberg, and told them to send a distress call at once. The blue spark jumped across the gap as Phillips sent CQD, come quick danger. Send SOS, Bride said. It is the new call and it may be your last chance to send it. Thus began the moment in history that changed radio. Two hours later, Jack Phillips and over 1,500 others were dead. The Titanic lay at the bottom of the ocean, and 713 survivors huddled in half-filled lifeboats waiting to be rescued. The tragic errors in the story of the Titanic pointed out the need of wireless regulation. The first ship to answer the distress call was the German liner, the Frankfurt. While the Frankfurt wireless operator was informing his captain, the Carpathia and Cape Race chimed in. When the Frankfurt operator came back to get more information, Phillips tapped back, Shut up! Shut up, you fool! Stand by and keep out! While this would seem bizarre by our standards, it made perfect sense to the operators of 1912. The Titanic, Carpathia, and Cape Race were filled with Marconi operators and stations, while the Frankfurt utilized the services of Marconi's German competitor, Telefunken. This commercial war was extended down to the individual operators. No routine traffic would ever pass from a Marconi station to a rival, and even in an emergency, if Marconi stations were available, the others would be shut out. The wireless controversy would continue after the Carpathia picked up the survivors. A wireless message was received, allegedly from the Carpathia, which said, All passengers of liner Titanic safely transferred to this ship and SS Parisian. See calm. 
Titanic being towed by Allen Liner Virginian to port. Other wireless messages appeared, also stating that all passengers were safe and the ship was being towed in. There was just one problem. These messages were not coming from the Carpathia. For one thing, her wireless had a maximum range of 150 miles. For another, the Carpathia wireless operator had made only a few transmissions to the Olympic, the sister ship of the Titanic and another Marconi operation, in which he had tapped out the list of survivors, some coded messages from Bruce Ismay, president of the White Star Line, then shut down his station. So complete was the radio silence from the Carpathia that they refused to answer the call from the Navy cruisers sent to the scene by President Taft. The White Star Line, owners of the Titanic, were still insisting that everyone was safe and that the ship had not sunk. But even as they made these claims, they had all the horrific details from the Olympic. And so would the rest of the world, thanks to a 21-year-old operator named David Sarnoff, who managed to detect the faint signals of the Olympic and broke the story. Faced with the truth and hounded by thousands of reporters and outraged relatives of passengers, the White Star Line officials finally broke down and revealed all. Meanwhile, the Carpathia steamed towards New York City. When she passed within range of shore stations, there were frenzied attempts by amateur wireless operators which formed a hissing mixture from which scarcely a complete sentence was intelligible. It didn't matter because the radio silence continued. At the Port of New York, the Carpathia was met by Senator William A. Smith of Michigan, a no-nonsense populist who was the chairman of the committee investigating the shipwreck. He immediately slapped subpoenas on everyone possible, including Harold Bride and Harold Cotman, wireless operator on the Carpathia. Marconi himself, who was in the U.S. at the time and had planned on taking the Titanic back to England, was also summoned to appear. The hearings revealed the information given above, plus the disturbing fact that the Californian was just 10 miles from the Titanic. Not only did the Californian not have a full-time wireless operation, but the ship's captain ignored the eight distress rockets sent up by the Titanic. As to the origin of the false messages concerning the saving of the ship and the passengers, no answer was ever found. However, Senator Smith sarcastically noted that in the interim, the Titanic was quickly reinsured and stock in the Marconi Company jumped from $55 a share to $225 a share. The senator did find out the cause of the Carpathia radio silence. It was Marconi himself. He had sent a wireless message to Bride and Cotman stating, Marconi Company taking good care of you. Keep your mouth shut. Hold your story. You will get big money. Now clear. It turned out that Marconi had an agreement with the New York Times for an exclusive story. Thus, essential information for desperate relatives and official inquiries from the President of the United States took a back seat to Marconi's interest. When Marconi got on the stand, Senator Smith pounced on him with astonishing vehemence. Marconi had been lionized by the nation, and now the senator was treating him like any other entrepreneur who put profit above the public. Senator Smith was warned that his attack on a man as popular as Marconi was political suicide, but he didn't care. In his obsession with his belief that the unregulated wireless spectrum was partially to blame in the Titanic disaster, he painted Marconi as a man willing to subordinate the public good to his goal of a complete wireless equipment and spectrum monopoly. Senator Smith used the Titanic hearings to condemn the laissez-faire status of the wireless and appealed for the international regulation of radio. On May 8, 1912, Senator Smith introduced a bill in the Senate. Among its provisions, 1. Ships carrying 50 passengers or more must have a wireless set with a minimum range of 100 miles. 2. Wireless sets must have an auxiliary power supply which can operate until the wireless room itself was underwater or otherwise destroyed. And 3. Two or more operators provide continuous service day and night. In response to the interference generated over the years, and especially when the Carpathia was within range, a provision was added that private stations could not use wavelengths in excess of 200 meters except by special permission. To avoid ownership of the spectrum by the Marconi Company, licenses would now be required issued by the Secretary of Commerce. 
Each government, marine, or commercial station would be authorized a specific wavelength, power level, and hours of operation. The initial legislation had considered the elimination of all private, non-commercial, that is, amateur stations, but Congress realized that it would be difficult and expensive to enforce. Therefore, since it was a well-known fact that long wavelengths were the best and anything below 250 meters was useless except for local communication, it was decided to compromise and give the amateurs 200 meters where they could work 25 miles maximum and would die out of their own accord in a few years. How the amateurs cope with 200 meters will be our focus next time. I hope you'll join us. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. Foundations of Amateur Radio. Radio amateurs like to do new things. Celebrate, remember, bring attention to, and overall have fun. Any excuse to get on air. One of the things that we as a community do is set up our radios in weird and wonderful places. On boats, near lighthouses, on top of mountains, in parks, you name it. Another thing we do is create special call signs to mark an occasion. Any occasion. For example, to mark the first time the then Western Australian Chief Scientist, Professor Lynn Beasley, was on air, she used the call sign VI6PROF. When Wally VK6 Yankee Sierra, now Silent Key, went on the air to educate the public about Rotary's End Polio Now campaign, he used VI6Polio. More recently, the Australian Rotarians of Amateur Radio operated Victor Kilo 65 Papa Foxtrot Alpha, Polio Free Africa. When it's active, you'll find Victor Alpha 3 Fire to remind you of Fire Prevention Week in Canada. The Chinese Radio Amateurs Club operates Bravo Zero Charlie Romeo Alpha through to Bravo 9 Charlie Romeo Alpha, which you can contact during the first week of May each year as part of the Chinese 5-5 Ham Festival. We create call signs for other things too. Data Victor Uniform 2 Delta Sierra India commemorates November 30th, the birthday of Indian physicist Sir Jagdish Chandra Bose, named by the IEEE as one of the fathers of radio science, by operating a special call sign Alpha Uniform 2 Juliet Charlie Bravo in his honour for a couple of weeks around the end of November. I mention this because it's not hard to achieve. It's called a special event call sign and many, if not all, amateur licensing authorities have provision for such a call sign. Rules differ from country to country. Some say that the call sign must be for something of special significance to the amateur community. Others require that it's of national or international significance. In Canada, for example, if you're celebrating an anniversary, it must be a minimum of a 25th increment. Different countries have different formats. The USA, for example, issues temporary one-by-one -one calls consisting of a letter followed by a digit followed by a letter. The UK offers GB and a digit followed by two or three letters. There's also special special event stations which can have a format like GB100 RSGB. In Canada, there's a whole system based on what kind of event, what region it's significant to, who's operating it, and so on. In the Netherlands, you can have a normal prefix followed by at most 8 characters and an overall maximum length of 12 characters, and you can have it for at most a year and only one at a time. In Germany, you can use a standard call sign pattern with a 4 to 7 character suffix, but only for a limited time. In Australia, there's the traditional VI and a digit, followed by any number of characters. But remember, if you make it massive, getting it in the log is not always easy, and using a digital mode like FT8 might not work as expected. Whatever you want to commemorate, celebrate or bring attention to, remember that your call sign is only one part of the process. Consider who's going to actually operate the call sign if you're going to issue QSL cards, if there are awards or a contest associated with the call sign if there needs to be a website, if this is a regular thing or a once-off. Another thing you need to consider is how you're going to publicise this call sign. There's no point in going to the effort of obtaining a special event call sign with nobody knowing about it. That's the whole point. No matter which way you jump, there's always a large range of special event call signs on the air at any one time. And making contact with one is often a massive thrill for the person operating the call sign, not to mention the person making the contact. So, if you have a chance to have a go, I'd encourage you to get on air with a special event call sign and make some noise. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo.
This is George W2XBS with the weekly propagation forecast for Friday, November 20th, 2020. Tad Cook K7RA in Seattle reports that as solar flux declined over the past week, he noticed less long distance propagation on 10 meters reported on pskreporter.info from his local grid square CN87. Propagation on 12 meters was quite strong, however, after 0100 UTC on November 15th, trans-equatorial propagation was evident between East Asia and Australia on 10 meters. Solar activity declined dramatically over the past week, with average daily sunspot numbers going from 31.3 to 12. On November 15th and 16th, there were no sunspots at all, which greatly affected the decline in this week's average. Solar flux weakened from a weekly average last week of 90 to 79.8 this week. The predicted solar flux over the next few weeks is also relatively weak at 75 on November 20th and 21st, 73 on November 22nd, 70 on November 23rd to the 26th, 72 on November 27th, 75 on November 28th to December 8th, and 72 on December 9th and 10th, and finally 70 on December 11th and 12th. The IARU Region 1 Monitoring System newsletter is now available and says that on October the 7th, three intruding over-the-horizon radars were active within the 40-meter amateur band, right next to each other, plus a wide non-ham FSK-like signal. The interference covered almost 50 kilohertz of the 7 megahertz amateur radio band. The monitoring service has observed these signals almost every day for months or even years. Many are classed as data mode CIS-12, which is not unlike the amateur data PSK modes, but wider in bandwidth. There are also various frequency shift keying transmissions, but worst of all are the daily active over-the-horizon radars, particularly those known as container and foghorn, but there are also others. Stranger Still is an unknown series of continuous five dashes, like the Morse code for the number zero, which is often heard at 7075 kilohertz. No light has been shed on this one so far. The International Amateur Radio Union Monitoring System newsletter can be found at www.iaru-r1.org. Well, if you come across a strange data signal and want to try to identify it, there's an excellent web resource called the Signal Identification Wiki. This has waterfall images and audio recordings of military transmissions and can be found at www.sigidwiki.com. Just navigate towards the military section. Without a physical receiver or the need to download specialist software, you can monitor the shortwave bands online with a web-based SDR. That stands for Software Defined Receiver. Have a look at www.websdr.org. ITP put on a Santa suit. That was years ago at an event at a country club in Peora, Illinois. This year, however, the president of the Longmont Amateur Radio Club in Colorado is hopping back on the sleigh to bring Santa to children via amateur radio. He plans to be on the air on the club repeaters between 6 and 7 p.m. Mountain Time on December 1st through 5th. Licensed hams are invited to share their shack with a youngster, perhaps a child or grandchild, who will likely be missing out on some of the traditional events or seeing Santa in person because of pandemic precautions. Chuck said he will make sure they still have a chance to talk to Santa by getting on the air with a licensed amateur. Chuck told the local newspaper, The Times Call, that the club is hosting this event for the first time because members are also hoping to give children an early holiday gift, the gift of an interest in amateur radio. He said it will give parents a chance to hear what their kids want to find under the tree. Local hams can visit the club website for repeater information at w0eno.org. The repeaters are also on Echolink, node 8305. What's the best gift you can give a ham for Christmas this year? A campaign in the UK called Get On The Air To Care has a suggestion. Organizers are calling it Get On The Air For Christmas, and the campaign is an offshoot of the highly successful Get On The Air To Care joint program of the National Health Service and Radio Society of Great Britain. While Get On The Air To Care was a special plea to amateurs to step up their on-air activities during the first pandemic lockdown to ease the situation for lonely amateurs, 
The focus during the holiday period will be to bring some good cheer if the lockdown is extended, as it will surely curtail celebrations between family and friends. Organizers want hams to be extra active during the holiday period between Saturday the 19th of December and Saturday the 9th of January. The Radio Society's website will be posting the schedules and information about special nets being held on Christmas Day and Boxing Day in particular, or at any other time during the season, and is asking for clubs to email their details as soon as possible. The nets will also be publicized in the next issue of RADCOM and in the GB2RS news broadcasts. The email address is radcom at rsgb.org.uk. Get on the Air for Christmas has also launched two Christmas Hope QSO parties, one that begins on Monday, the 21st of December, and another that begins on Monday, the 4th of January. Look online for hashtag GOTA4C to follow this campaign. Items belonging to World War II Bletchley Park codebreaker Alan Turing that were stolen from the UK decades ago are to be returned from the United States. The mathematician's miniature OBE medal is among 17 items that were taken from Dorset's Sherbourne School by Julia Turing, who is actually no relation, in 1984. According to US court papers and Sherborne School, Ms. Turing, who legally changed her name from Julie Schwinghamer in 1988, removed the items without permission from archives given to the school in 1965 by the Turing family in memory of the time he spent there as a pupil. Ms. Turing attempted to loan the items to the University of Colorado for display in 2018, claiming to be a relative of the mathematician. After the alarm was raised, an investigation was carried out by police and the items were found at her home in Conifer in Colorado. A US civil court case launched against her has been settled out of court and the items are due to be returned to Sherborne School. Our thanks go to Stephen, Goal 7 Victor Foxtrot Yankee, for spotting this item on the BBC News website, where you can read the full story. In the Chicago suburbs, what started out as science fiction has ended up as science fact. WendyCon, the well-attended annual science fiction convention, had to be scrapped due to the pandemic, but the event went forward anyway as a virtual convention known as BreezyCon on November 13th through the 15th. While sci-fi enthusiasts enjoyed panels, music, and gaming during those three days, with socially distanced chatter on the Discord app, hams from the DuPage Amateur Radio Club, W9DUP, showed their support as well. Taking their cue from BreezyCon's change in plans, the move from in-person to virtual, a special event station W9W got on the air, just as scheduled, and just as it had done in previous years for WindyCon. As things turned out, the operation was a virtual success. Using single sidebands, CW and FT8, DuPage Amateur Radio Club's hams operated their personal stations and paid tribute to sci-fi fans who were attending the big event from a safe distance. Some might say this is truly the stuff of science fiction, but for those radio operators among us who have already lost this year's in-person opportunities at Hamvention, Friedrich Schaffen, and the big Tokyo ham fair, this was simply ham radio, doing what it does best. A new multi-transmitter distributed category is being added to the CQ Worldwide WPX contests. The change is to better accommodate operators who wish to compete as a team without all operators being in the same physical location. According to CQ WPX contest directors Bud Trench, AA3B, and Ed Munns, W0YK, the new category will permit up to six separate stations in different locations, but all within the same DX entity and CQ zone, to operate as a single contest entry. This was inspired by innovations being made in response to the pandemic, but the new category will be permanent. In addition, contact alerting assistance will now be permitted in all single operator categories except for the classic categories, which must be unassisted. Classic overlay stations will now have a maximum operating time in each contest of 24 hours rather than 36 hours. The rule changes take effect 
With the 2021 running of the WPX contests, RTTY on February 13th and 14th, SSB on March 27th and 28th, and CW on May 29th and 30th next year. Produced by amateurs for amateurs and originating from Albany, New York, you're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 2 Executive Committee has appointed Carlos A. Santa Maria, CO2JC, as the new Region 2 Emergency Coordinator. He succeeds Cesar Pio Santos, HR2P, who retired after 12 years of service. Santa Maria has extensive experience serving as Federación de Radioaficionados de Cuba National Emergency Network Coordinator. He oversaw the network's activities during hurricanes and earthquakes, maintaining contact with emergency coordinators in other Caribbean countries to protect emergency frequencies. He also advises the Cuban headquarters of the United Nations Organization on emergency communications during disasters. The IARU Region 2 Executive Committee credited Santos' success in dealing with emergency committees and telecom authorities. The EC called him a key player in ensuring that Central America benefited from an international telecommunications union pilot plan for an operational windling system in the region, including the provision of equipment, installation, and training. The Executive Committee also credited Santos with presenting numerous emergency communications workshops. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. When climbing on a commercial tower, we need to be aware of RF safety laws. Exposure has been the subject of debate lately, especially since the guidelines have been introduced into the amateur's vocabulary. There are certain requirements you need to be aware of. Some are required by law, and some are not. This all depends on the tower and how it is loaded with commercial services. For those of you who are not aware of the federally mandated safety guidelines, there's a general set of rules about working safely with sources of energy. Lockout, tagout is a phrase which refers to the use of safety devices to help prevent accidental injury to workers servicing equipment. On towers, lockout, tagout can include seals on breaker switches, inline coax switches, or other similar devices. I'm not going to refer to any specifics, but to good personal safety guidelines. If you are working on a shorter tower with perhaps a few paging systems, you need to consider exposure to RF as well as the risk of injury from contact with active antennas. When you are working on or near an antenna or its feed line, you must ensure that it is difficult or impossible for someone to turn on the transmitter while you are on the tower. If you are at 250 feet, and your partner is on the ground, another person working in the transmitter shack could easily turn on the transmitter that is attached to your body. It is your responsibility to unplug the transmitter's power cord or remove the fuses, mark or lock the breaker so anyone else not involved in your work cannot accidentally turn on the injury-causing transmitter. Before you start working, make sure everyone in the area is aware of what should or should not be turned on and install some sort of locking device. A cable tie is suitable as a lockout in many circumstances. I sometimes put cable ties through the holes in the prongs of a 115 volt plug to prevent it from being plugged in while I'm on the tower. If I'm working on a hard wired system, I may remove the coax and cable tie it to something inside the cabinet along with something like my car keys to prevent me from forgetting to reconnect the coax as well as preventing it from getting turned on and cooking my fingers off. When working on a crowded tower you may have to arrange to climb at pre-scheduled off-air times to minimize exposure to powerful RF fields. I will not climb near an active broadcast antenna and prefer to climb near active paging system antennas during off-peak times. This is another reason why I prefer to climb at night. The essence of lockout tagout is to ensure that the system you are working on is at or very close to a zero potential energy state. 
Equally important is that the energy supply to the device is locked in a zero energy state by any reasonable means which would prevent a casual user from activating the device while you are working on it. Some simple methods of locking out a transmitter would include shutting off a breaker and locking it in the off position, removing fuses and locking the fuse box shut, switching off a breaker and using a hardware store breaker lock and tag to mark it out of service. For the home-based amateur, shutting off the power to the radios connected to the, TV, to the tower is a good beginning. Unplugging power cords or unhooking coax wires is another. Here's another good reason to have a ground crew. They can also become involved in lockout tagout. Just remember to lower each device to a zero energy state before starting the climb. Sometimes this is not possible, but always plan for the safest climb. After doing it several times, it'll become second nature to you. There's a lot more on lockout tagout than I have time to cover here. So if you're climbing for a living, be sure to review your employer's safety and exposure guidelines. Another place to look for information is the OSHA webpage or your state's electrical safety codes. Remember, you cannot tell if an antenna is transmitting just by looking at it. Direct contact with a transmitting antenna can leave you with an instantaneous and very painful burn. Getting a second degree burn on the palm of your hand at 150 feet on a tower would ruin anyone's day. Also keep in mind that just because a transmitter is unplugged, it may still offer a small voltage difference between the tower and that antenna. It is impossible to attain the exact same ground potential between all the systems on a tower. So the risk of a shock while climbing will always be present. Just be careful when you touch antennas on towers. Remember, Tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on amateur radio repeater systems, streaming on the Internet, or on great low-power FM broadcast stations like WGXC-FM, part of the Wave Farm on 90.7 MHz in Accra, New York, serving Greene County and the southern regions of New York's Capital District. And finally this week, 20 years ago on November 13th, the Expedition 1 crew turned on the Aris Ericsson radio for the first time and completed several contacts with the Aris ground stations around the world to validate the radio communication system. These inaugural contacts launched an incredible two-decade operations journey on ISS, enabling Aris to inspire, engage, and educate our next generation of explorers and provide the ham radio community a platform for lifelong learning and experimentation. In celebration of the ISS 20th anniversary, ARIS was part of an ISS research and development conference panel, session entitled 20 Years of STEM Experiments on the ISS. 20 years of continuous operations is a phenomenal accomplishment, but what makes it even more extraordinary is that ARIS has achieved this through hundreds of volunteers that are passionate in paying it forward to our youth and ham radio community. Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, ARIS International Chairman, said, On behalf of the ARIS International team, I would like to express our heartfelt thanks to every volunteer that has made ARIS such an amazing success over the past 20 years. Your passion, drive, creativity, and spirit made it happen. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved. 
You've just listened to a truncated version of This Week in Amateur Radio. Please visit TWIAR.net for the full version.